for the past 100 years, actuaries have been embracing new technology and adding new technology to their toolbox. So what those reinsurers did is they provided cover on a parametric trigger basis. Or the ILS investors, they also have an appetite for parametric triggers. Greetings dear listeners and a very very warm welcome to this episode of the Micro Podcast. It is July 2020 and I'm delighted to have a guest with me, Andreas Zell, the Managing Director and the Founder of AKR Zell Consulting in Singapore. The company covers the entire value chain of risk transfer and Andreas is a long-term resident and knowledgeable professional here in the region. Hello Andreas, it's a great pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome, how are you my friend? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for having me. Let us um, talk a little bit about the actuarial profession has uh, developed in Asia over the past uh, 15 years. So what's your view on that? If you are a consulting actuary doing statutory work across the region, you will have seen many regulatory changes. You will have seen risk-based capital being introduced. You will have seen stress tests being introduced and valuation frameworks. On the other hand, If you're working in reinsurance, I would say the biggest change in the past 15 years is the availability of CAT model output. 15 years ago, many Asian countries used to be so-called unmodeled territory, whereas nowadays, in many cases, there is now some CAT model output available, which the reinsurance actuary can use and import it into their pricing tool or into their DFA model. Can I just pick up on that point for a sec? Can you give us a few examples which countries, or better said, um, which perils in which countries are modeled now or models are available? 15 years ago, flood was completely unmodeled in any country in Asia. Now we even have flood models for some Asian countries besides windstorm and earthquake. For example? For example, Thailand. And then there were earthquake models available 15 years ago. Not many, and those were mostly aggregate type of models, i.e. models that worked with more aggregated exposure data. Whereas today, many of these models have evolved into more detailed models that are able to make use of more granular data. And lastly, perhaps the windstorm models. These have evolved too. The first generation of windstorm models for Asia would normally just cover the windstorm damage. However, as we all know a typhoon is wet and the current generation of typhoon models normally also covers the water part the water damage of a typhoon pick up on a point you made earlier on you talked about data there's a perception around that there are no data probably more specifically exposure data in asia Uh, can you comment on that please it used to be a problem The availability of exposure data and also the quality of exposure data in Asia used to be a problem indeed, and to some extent it still is. However, some countries that previously only had aggregated exposure data available, some of those countries have now evolved and there is more granular exposure data available in these countries. And other countries which previously didn't have any exposure data available Now they do have some exposure data available in an aggregated form. So things are moving in the right direction. Okay, that's that's great to hear, of course. That's propulsing the industry forward significantly. But Roy, please go ahead, I was interrupting you. Yes, and lastly, the actuaries working in direct insurance. I would say for them, the biggest changes are yet to come. Since you just started talking about the future, let's maybe move on and Talk a little bit, what, what do you think the, the actuary of the future, so call it the actuary of 2025 or 2030, what kind of skills does the profession need to stay relevant in five or 10 years from now? Well, let me remind you that for the past 100 years, actuaries have been embracing new technology and adding new technology to their toolbox, while at the same time not losing the bigger picture. Several decades ago, The actuaries have added new reserving techniques and new modeling techniques to their toolbox, but they remained insurers at heart. 
or remained reinsurers at heart, or brokers. And specifically over the past 15 years or so, some actuaries in Asia have familiarized themselves with cat modeling, not to become a cat modeler themselves, but to do their own job better, to be a better actuary, to be a more relevant actuary. And now, with the emergence of AI, machine learning and data science, the actuaries once again need to embrace new technology, while still keeping the bigger picture in mind. By embracing, I do not necessarily mean to become an expert in these disciplines, but rather to collaborate effectively with the experts in those disciplines. Well, you just used uh, three, three buzzwords or three keywords that we hear and read very often. Uh, the data, the artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on and so forth. Could you share a few examples, either real life already, or, or examples that you uh, can sort of envision that they will become insurance reality anytime soon? We are already seeing artificial intelligence being used in claims handling, and that's already happening very fast in some lines of business, for instance, health insurance. Even as a reserving actuary, you could actually make use of artificial intelligence. I'm saying could. Can, can you, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, share with us how, how that could look like? The artificial intelligence would look at a new claim that has just come in, then go through the existing claims and try to find similar claims. Claims that had happened in the past, but are similar in nature, and learn how those older claims have developed. Then the artificial intelligence would take that new claim and develop it in the same manner as those older similar claims. So with artificial intelligence in claims reserving, the claims reserving would no longer happen on a portfolio level, but rather on an individual claims level. This is what could be done, but to my knowledge it is not being done yet, but it is possible. However, we currently do not know enough about any potential downsides or disadvantages of this approach. Also, we do not know yet how good this approach would be for the very large claims. Maybe it works better for the medium-sized claims, who knows? Okay, well, that's, that's, a, great, that's a great example that shows us what is possibly on the horizon. If, if we stay with that uh, topic of uh, evolving the work environment, so how, how do you think this will evolve for the actuary? We've been talking about gig economy, work from home, outside, outsourcing, insourcing and so on and so forth. So how, how do you think the actuarial profession will be affected by it, but also be able to, to carve out the, respect, the respective niche for itself? Well. Working from home, as we have seen now, isn't really a problem for the actuarial profession. We are still able to get our job done. In a broader sense, I would say the environment is changing in the sense that innovation labs have been set up in Asia by some global insurance groups. Insurance groups that are headquartered outside Asia, but they have actually set up innovation labs in Asia. So if you're working in Asia as an actuary, chances are that next door you've got colleagues working for one of those innovation labs. Well, that's interesting. Can you, can you share with us what these labs are working on and whether any of their work has hit the roads already? Some innovation labs were set up to spark innovation in an existing line of business. That could be health, for instance. Some labs were set up to gain more experience with new ways to run an existing line of business for example, motor insurance, and some innovation labs were set up to spark innovation in a new line of business, cyber insurance, for instance. Well, if I can just pick up on the, on the innovation topic, um, the protection gap is a, is a big issue in, in Asia. So maybe if we can spend a bit of time trying to link that current well-known problem of the protection gap, the widening protection gap, and how innovation could possibly help the industry and ultimately societies to close that gap? Yes, great point. Sadly, the protection gap is actually widening. Any NatCat event is causing a certain economic loss, and only a small portion of that is insured. 
so there's a big gap. And sadly, this gap is actually widening, not narrowing. That's a, in a way counter, it's a bit counterintuitive, right? And you think that economies are progressing, GDP is growing. I mean, the current, current phase left aside. So, so why is this gap widening? Shouldn't it shrink? It should shrink. But unfortunately, along with the economic growth, the urbanization is increasing and more and more people live in cities. Because of the urbanization, there is now a high concentration of values, whether insured or not, in a relatively small space. Plus economic growth on top of that. Plus the increasing interconnectedness. So these three, urbanization, economic growth, increasing interconnectedness, are accelerating each other, driving the economic losses. And the insurance penetration is not able to catch up with this development. That's why the gap is widening. All right, got it. Okay, thank you. Back to you. Some innovation, you said it, is needed to help closing this protection gap. Is, is there any product or solution that's on top of your mind? In agriculture, for instance, the insurance penetration could be rather than trying to organically increase it, could be increased significantly in one go with government schemes. The premium for those schemes paid by the respective government bodies and the policyholders or the beneficiaries being the farmers. This could be a solution that would increase the insurance penetration sort of overnight. Is that sort of an idea of yours or do you know cases where this is actually being done or has been done somewhere in Asia? This is already happening. The larger reinsurers have already issued such covers. They've got people who are in charge of facilitating such covers and talking to governments across the region to make such schemes happen. So we have actually seen that. And even the ILS market does have an appetite for this type of cover. Oh, great. You just um, mentioned three big letters, ILS. Maybe we can spend uh, the remainder of the time talking about these instruments. Why um, you think they can help us to close the protection gap? Because I have, and obviously I'm, I'm a bit too narrow-minded here, I have, I have a bit the impression that ILS is largely a US windstorm in instrument. And in Asia, it's nascent at this moment in time. So I'm, I'm curious to hear your views about it. You're right. Even today, most of the ILS issued will cover US windstorm in some form or shape. And those insurance schemes mentioned earlier, the schemes protecting the farmers in a particular country, they have mainly been negotiated by the largest reinsurers. And in some of those countries, there is no reliable exposure data available. So the classic indemnity trigger, which is common in reinsurance, isn't working. So what those reinsurers did is they provided cover on a parametric trigger basis because parametric trigger is sort of ideal if no exposure data is available. So those agricultural schemes, they usually come with parametric triggers. However, the ILS market or the ILS investors, they also have an appetite for parametric triggers. In reinsurance, I would say it is only a small number of reinsurers, really the very large ones only, that do have an appetite for parametric triggers. Whereas in ILS, it is quite a broad investor base that does have an appetite to invest in parametric trigger type of ILS. Tools and methods that will continue to evolve and get better, will have more and better data. Uh, we have um, the actuaries, of course, that drive the evolution, evolve with it. And we have a protection gap as, a, as an issue that we can solve putting all these, um, these methods and these tools together, right? Nice summary, Reto. But allow me to add that not many people are working on closing the protection gap. Most of us, including myself, spend most of our time on those risks that are currently insured, as opposed to the risks that are currently uninsured. Anyway, actuaries are here to help. Besides reinsurance, ILS is a topic that's close to my heart, 
So if you've got a question on ILS or on traditional reinsurance or on any type of risk transfer for that matter, I'll try to answer your question as best as I can. Thank you. Andreas, thank you very much. It's been a great joy talking to you. Your insights were really interesting for all of us. Thanks, Reto. Thanks for having me. The listeners, also thank you for having been with us. Uh, click on the show notes below. There you find all the links to the contact details for Andreas and myself. In the meantime, stay safe, enjoy whatever you're doing, and goodbye for now. Until the next episode. <laughs>